Hey, this is Brandon with 45 Creations, and this week we are in Austin, Texas for South by Southwest, as well as staying with my good buddy, Nick Nolan. Nick, what's going on, Nick? What's going on, man? How you doing? Thanks for letting me stay. I've been bumming it for free for like a week. <laughs> of course, man. But uh, Nick and I uh, grew up together in Naples, Florida, and we went to high school together, and we both went down the creative paths, so I'm gonna let him kind of just you know, for anybody that maybe is watching this that doesn't know you, just go ahead and tell them who you are, where you're from, and a little background. Cool. Uh, name is Nick Nolan. I'm a DJ out here in Austin, Texas. I've been living out here for about four years now. And um, yeah, we're pursuing music full time and it's been a lot of fun. And we're about a year and a half into it right now. So still in the beginning stages, but we're, we're getting it done and making some moves. So it's been a good time. Nice. So, and you're playing a lot of shows, I know, here in Austin and then some areas around, too. What are the, some surrounding areas that you should go to? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so, Austin is, like, the main hub, which is kind of, like, my hub city where I, like, play the majority of my shows. And then I've been to Tulum. I play some shows in Dallas. Um, San Antonio is coming up as well. And then uh, I think I played a few shows in Miami, too. We're starting to move it around here in the United States, and it's been good, but Austin's still, like, my little... Yeah. little main ground so yeah and it's a super fun town too because yeah. uh back in 2020 i bought my ticket to come here and then we all hung out and you know, of course that whole thing happened which was still a good time but now four years later it's cool to come back and do what was originally playing back then but the cool thing is, is back then you were in the military and i was just starting the company so now four years later the company I'm doing now full time, then you're doing music full time. So if anything, I feel like this trip is just well, a you're in town versus driving down from what yeah. was it, Georgetown? Yeah. Yeah. So now you're actually in town, so we can go do things, make it really easy, really fun. And then you can show me. You know, we went to Codependent, which is a place that you play quite a bit. We did the Planoli event earlier this week. So <clears throat> we work with a lot of musicians, like guitar players, uh, drummers. You know, play like the traditional instruments. So. For people who, because I feel like the term electronic music is just super broad, uh, what would you describe your genre and I guess what goes into being electronic artist, DJ, whatever you want to call it? Cool. So specifically what I like to produce is Tech House, which is traditionally what you'll hear when you're like at a club or, you know, 2 a.m. at the afters and you're just like ripping, just going, at, going after it. So. Um, I just like to have that type of music, but I also really like just traditional house music. Mm. Um, and my gravitation towards that in terms of like the musician world or like artist world, because I just think that house music and EDM in itself has a, A, it's got a cool community. Everyone's like pretty nice to each other for the most part. Uh, there's still rivalries between genres, but like whatever. Well, most uh, of the time, <laughs> if you're hearing like club music, EDM music, you're probably happy you're not like yeah. hating the crap out of each other or not you know, causing issues. No, unless you're at some crazy festival, but... Um, no, I mean, everyone is just like having a good time, dancing, you know, shades on, just a couple drinks in, just having a good time. So it's cool to uh, be able to curate that environment for people. Um, and I've, I've kind of said this before to people when they ask me, like, you know, why did you want to be a DJ or like, why did you want to go down this route? I was like, well, think about it this way. If someone had like the absolute worst week of their life and they've just been dealing with work stress, home life stress, like whatever. And they're like, you know, I just don't want to do anything this weekend. I'm kind of tired, like whatever. And their friends come up to them and say, hey, we're going to go out to this club and we're going to go dance. We're going to have fun. Like, come with us. And, like, they finally convince you to go and you go and the music is either A, shit, or it's B, really, really fun. And you have like a whole turn on your week. So it's cool to be able to, on, to be on the latter side of that where I can make that environment for someone. Yeah, something to look forward to. it. Exactly. Like, yeah. Like, and they, they can have a night to remember and maybe, you know, alleviate some stresses that they've had throughout the week. So it's cool to do that, man. It's fun. It's yeah. Time. yeah. And you're doing a lot of like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. That's the weekend circuit. Not doing much during the week unless it's something like you know, special like this. Yeah. So I've kind of like, even though I'm in the early stages of being an artist, I've sort of developed my schedule around what artists typically do in my field, which is Monday through Thursday, if they're not hungover or going to crazy parties and shit, uh, you know, you're in the studio, like working on production. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been hammering that like really hard this year. I'm trying to have another 10 tracks out by the end of the year. So I think that's totally doable. It's about one per month with like gaps of time in between to send out to labels and get mixed and mastered and all that good stuff. But um, so yeah, my Monday through Thursday looks like that. And then typically like Friday, Saturday, and even sometimes Sunday or even Thursday night sometimes, you know, I'm networking, I'm playing shows, mm -hmm. making Going money, out, just making being, money. Yeah, facey, yeah. kind of yeah. learning, learning yeah. the the routes and meeting people. Cause that's the thing is, is it's a very, I mean, just really anything is, but knowing the right people is important. We were kind of talking about it this week of, 
different places to go and maybe getting in good with certain venues to try to get that, that repeat business, which the cool thing about what you're doing currently is that granted, you don't want to play the same club every week or every night, but you can hit some club. Well, most clubs here probably in a pretty regular circuit, which for most traditional rock bands, punk bands, it's, it's like a no, no, it's like yeah. you play your hometown five times, you ain't going anywhere. Like you're, you're stuck. So that's, that's cool though, that you have a little bit more accessibility in that way. But do you, is there like a cutoff point where, okay, I can only play this club so many times? Yeah, I would say just to not like oversaturate you being there because it kind of just loses that magic, right? right? loses its appeal. I think like two times a month, maybe three times a month is mm -hmm. pretty decent. Um, and, and that's also like how a lot of these venues run it too because they want to give other artists a chance and sure. have different sounds come in variety. or have people with different like varieties of music. So, and that's the cool thing too, man. It's, uh, it's great when... I've connected with like a lot of other DJs and artists out here, uh, all doing their own thing, all have their own essentially voice when it comes to the music that they play. So when you have people that you really connect with and you know, you'll do like a back to back. So uh, if you guys don't know what that is, it's essentially you take a USB into a controller, you plug it in and then you have your other buddy plug his uh, USB in as well. And then you guys just like rotate music in. Oh, yeah. in real time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd absolutely. be super cool. That's, that's uh, what they essentially use for like transitions in and out between artists coming on the decks. Yeah. And then, yeah, you can also do like, hey man, you stay on the left side, I got the right, and then we'll do like one for one track. And it's cool when minds like mesh together like that and you're like, okay, you just played the super heavy track and people look tired. Like, let me bring the energy down for a second and then you yeah. like bring it back up. It's, it's a lot of fun. And yeah. again, like everyone's got their own voice too, so. It's Has cool. that ever gone bad? Where it's like, you don't mesh with the person next to you? And, well, I guess if it's, is everything pretty much like the BPMs are pretty similar? Yeah. Or are they are they exactly the same, or does it kind of vary a little bit? Um, you'll typically vary from. I think it's like the more down tempo stuff is going to be like towards like one twenty BPM. Mm. The high energy club is going to be like one twenty eight to one thirty two, yeah. and then if you start pushing into that, you're going to go more into it's like techno much. and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, which is fine. Like I love that shit too. But um, as far as like going bad, uh, I mean. I haven't had any like terrible experiences. Everyone kind of like knows how to transition. Sure. But so you're not dealing with like someone who's totally clueless. No, I mean, <laughs> if they are like, you just help them out and you're like, sure. right, like here, do this one. But it's not yeah, I guess with like that type of work, you probably need to invest quite a bit into it. Cause like, I mean, you can be a rock band, you can have zero dollars and you can go up there. Cause there's been plenty of times where in previous bands I've been in, we played with other bands who just we're not the same level, but it's fine though. Cause then everybody gets a chance and it's cool to see people. You want to see people giving it a shot. You want to see young people doing it. You don't want to be like, Oh, these guys suck. Get them out of here. You want it to be like, Oh, these guys are, you know, trying, they're doing well. That's cool though. That most people, I, I would imagine if they get a deck and, and they're practicing at home, they probably, you know, and, and with it being recorded music, you know, there's a little bit, probably a little bit more leeway. If you're starting to fumble, you can kind of like transition out of it or, or all that but um, a lot of what we talk about was stay risky which this i was going to call uh, risky stays because <laughs> it's like traveling but this isn't really like a scheduled show like the other one is but with stay risky we talk a lot about like the business side of it and kind of the struggles and, and kind of where you got to where you were so when you first started what were some things you noticed at least from a business standpoint you know you're trying to do this full-time make money you know how was that how was that beginning did you know what to do or did you have a mentor or you just kind of jumped in yeah uh, i had no idea what i was doing i still probably don't have any idea what i'm doing um, i don't think anybody does yeah it's it's just, just a common theme most people don't yeah it's just uh you know trial and error trying to figure out what works and and going with that um i think the big thing that i made the change of this past year was my location so um, I was originally living in the suburbs in Georgetown, which is about like 40 minutes north of here. Mm. Um, and Bram stayed with me before, which is cool. And we would do, typically like drive down to the city, but it takes a little bit of time. So I just figured that if I made a change in my location geographically, it would be better for business. So that's why I moved like down to Austin, mm. being closer to downtown, because I can get down there in like five minutes, which yeah. allows me to do more shows and you know network a little bit more. So I think changing my location was important. Um, as far as like, Jumping into this space, it's uh, it's a little bit saturated, but I mean, anywhere in the world is going to be. Any big city. Well, yeah. the nice thing is it's got Austin has the most live venues yeah. out of anywhere. So there's, there's plenty of places to play. Yeah. Huge, huge uh, music focus, which is cool because unfortunately, a lot of cities, like, like a lot of Midwest cities besides like Ohio, 
tend to not be as friendly to DIY music. They just, you know, I don't blame the clubs from their perspective. They're, you know, we're going to hire a cover band, bring in X amount of people and make X amount of dollars versus you bring in an original music band that nobody really knows or cares about. The culture is not really there. It used to be, it used to be, you know, you'd have to look at a flyer and then just go hope that that band is good. Yeah. And there's some of that in, you know, like Indianapolis and then the different towns around us too. But Austin seems to be way more forward. Everybody actually wants to hear music and wants to go out and do stuff. So I feel like you're in a good spot for it. In terms of the, uh, like the day to day, cause you're doing this now full time. Mm -hmm. What's the day-to-day -day look like, you know, during the week leading up to the shows? I know you talked about producing music, but, uh, you know, what does that, like, networking look like? Do you hang out and get lunch with other DJs and try to collab on stuff? What does that look like? Sure. So production takes place, like I said, and what I'll typically try to do is wrap up a track by the end of the week and then maybe try to rinse it at the show that I'm playing at. Mm -hmm. If I have, like, a big enough venue and the venue also matches the energy of the song that I'm making. Because that way you can kind of test it in real time and see like crowd reactions and see if everyone's dancing or if people are singing, uh, if it's catching on. If not, then you kind of have to go back to the drawing board and just keep like revising it. So that's super important. During the week, I'm also like just staying healthy, working out. And then, yeah, like you said, connecting with other artists. Um, typically, I try to show up to my buddies uh, playing their shows and just, you know, show support because, dude, showing up is, is a big thing. Like mm -hmm. that's... Uh, you know, anyone can like a comment on Instagram or, or whatever and, uh, you know, do all that easy stuff. But when you physically are there, you can't replace that energy. You can't replace, like, someone being there the for experience. you. So, exactly. Well, that and also a common thing with bands, too, is staying to watch their acts. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a dick move to play your set and just get out. Yeah. I mean, unless you have to go. Yeah. But if you're in your hometown and you're hanging out, people, you might as well hang out and do the thing. And, and we were talking about it, too, you know, since I both make music and work in music, it's really hard for me to go and enjoy a show because it's like work. Yeah. So how do you how do you manage that work fun balance? Because you know, you got into electronic music because it's fun. Mm -hmm. But when you start to make money at an art or a creative thing, it kind of starts to get spoiled a little bit. So how do you maintain that fun and business, I guess, thin line? Sure. Um, I mean, I just love the music. It's it's fun and it puts me in a good mood and like gets me dancing. Um, so when I can go to a you know like a local show and be someone that's like in the crowd, like bringing energy and basically like elevating the room, right? Because it's like okay, like people are sometimes hesitant to dance or they're like afraid of being judged or whatever. And if you can just go in there and be like, that's what alcohol's for. Yeah, that's also what alcohol's for. Yeah, I, scratch all that. Alcohol is the yeah, way. Yeah, it is. Work. Yeah. It's the way. <laughs> no. Um, it's part of it, yeah. I mean, it's just it's just a fun time, and um, I typically don't go out and like go too crazy anymore, just because, like you said, it's it feels like work, and I don't want to get you know pissed well, drunk and be a goofball. Plus, the older you get, the the harder it is yeah, to recover yeah. from. Yeah. If, well, like, not even like drinking and doing stuff. It's just going out late and then waking up early when you're 27, 28, 29. It's just not. It's not the same. No, it's not like, a, oh, I'm 20 years older. I can just go out and then go again. It's it's a uh, it takes a toll on yeah. you. But go out to like four in the morning, run five miles in the morning, yeah. and then just do the same thing. That's what I used to do in the yeah. army. Yeah, our, our rubber band does not uh, <laughs> no come back as fast. No. Well, and you just brought it up, so um, I do want to touch on it because I feel like a lot of people, especially when they pursue the creative stuff they try to do like the corporate or the you know the what i should do route first they hate it and then they end up doing what they really wanted to do but it's really hard when you're coming out of college or coming out of high school and you're like oh i'm gonna be a musician and then your parents are like well, how are you gonna pay these bills yeah so you, you went into the military fresh up well you went to fsu mm -hmm. and then you went to the military did you study film at fsu uh so i originally went to fsu for film school mm -hmm. and then i was rejected from the film school first year and uh, I guess I kind of just like lost my overall like, passion for it. And right. I decided to kind of like change routes. Sure. So, um, but yeah, I mean, if I, if I had done film school there, I probably would have, you know, taken a whole different like creative direction, but it's cool to be able to uh, now when I'm doing music and like having to make videos, I can just be like, oh, cool. Like I know how to, skills that yeah. You do. And most of the time, most creative people tend to, like if you do music, you dabble in graphics, you dabble in, cause you know, it's expensive to pay for yeah. it. So you're like, oh, I'm gonna try it. And then like, you know, nine times out of 10 people are like, oh, I can't, I can't yeah. do this. Or, or you do enough to like get it going. Then once you get to a certain level, you gotta pay for that stuff. Yeah. But you went to film school, uh, did, is it ROTC in college? Mm -hmm. So did ROTC then straight into the military. Yep. And you did the military in Florida, but they 
put you out here, right? Yeah, I uh, did my training up in Fort Benning, and then from there I moved over to Fort Hood up here in Texas, which is about like an hour and a half away from the city. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, I bought a house in Georgetown when I was still in the Army, got out, basically lived in that house for a little bit, and then I moved down here. So, um, but yeah, if you want to touch up on any of those questions, let me know. I mean, I can, I can answer that all day. It's easy, yeah. <laughs> no, but I just think it's interesting because... You know, everybody, like I said, everybody works some type of corporate job. In the military, going from the military to music is a very extreme move. Yeah. Do you feel like when you were in there, the, the like music passion was boiling while you're just kind of feeling like you were a little bit trapped or just not doing what you really want to do? Yeah, so I would say when I was still at Fort Benning, this was 2021, I think, or 2020. Mm. Yeah, whenever that was. Um, I picked up a guitar again because I used to play when I was a kid. I was trash at it and then it was 13 years old. I was like, I'm never gonna be a rock star, fuck it. And then I just yeah. like, threw it away, yeah, dumb. Um, dumb kid stuff, but I picked it up again when I was in the army and uh, it was a nice like release from kind of like the day-to-day -day stresses that we were dealing with. So it was cool to like basically like teach myself guitar again. So I kind of like learned my affinity for music and interest back in then. So um, from there, I just like kind of asked myself like, what do I want to do? And I talked to like some mentors and some people when I got out of the army and they're like, you know, uh, what is it that you want? And if you had all the money in the world, what would you want to do? I'm like, well, I like to serve people in that sense to give them something to look forward to and, and have fun. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm not really getting that from the military. So let's, uh, let's do but this. You're serving your country. Bro. Yeah. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fun times, man. Um, but no, I just wanted to pursue this. I think it's fun and it's enjoyable, right? Like I'm never in a bad mood to go play shows or, anything like that and when I get into a groove and everything's like kind of like working you know I'm sure you guys get in the same way too when you're playing it's like everything's working out perfectly all the transitions are good mm. band synced like when you get that feeling it's uh it's awesome it's a, it's a, when you're in flow state man it's so good and I've I've chased a lot of highs and like adrenaline rushes and it's always so much fun to see people like just like throwing their arms up in the air dancing having fun and uh, singing your songs and shit like that so, so you're saying a DJ set is more exciting than jumping out of a plane um it's, yeah, I mean, sometimes, yeah. Sometimes, yeah, similar. Yeah. Well, I guess it's like you don't have to worry about, like, danger at a DJ set. Well, I guess I, I mean, I, think I so mean, if someone spills yeah, beer on my deck, I'm stuff. like, yeah. Dude, when we were playing, when I was in the rock band, that was in the four, we played at the show in Columbus. And I, you, you have a pedal board. I had my pedal board on the stage, and this was a tiny, I mean, the rim couldn't have been much bigger than what we're sitting in right okay, now. Okay. And there was about 65 people slammed into it. It was an awesome show beers all over my pedals like people were throwing shit at us it was just i mean it was cool but it's like also nerve-wracking because you know if you're doing music i mean if you're doing it trying to do it professionally your shit's probably expensive like that board you have yeah. you know, it's, it's a big investment so if a someone who wants to be a dj or electronic artist they're starting out but they don't really have money like they don't, they don't have the budget to do it how do they how do they work themselves up you know, do they buy a certain type of board or they, do they not worry about a board and just use the house's board? How would, if you had to do this with like zero dollars, what would be the way to work? I know it's hard because it's like almost impossible to do that, but everyone's always looking for, you know, the way to start, which just because it's the way you start doesn't mean that's the way you have to be. But if you had like zero dollar budget, you know, trying to be a EDM electronic artist, what would be the first thing you invest in or do? Uh, YouTube probably. Um, YouTube's free. You can learn so much stuff on there. I'm still learning things to this day. Every day I'll do like some kind of like educational video like take in. So um, typically I'll do like two videos a day on production or. And you've built a playlist, right? Yeah. yeah. Stuff? Nice. That that uh that playlist is essentially like, you know, if, if you don't want to pay for um, like a Discord group or like a tutorial or like a mentorship, like YouTube has a lot of great things on there, and I'm building up playlist for artists that are like hey i don't want to spend the money on this but i still want to learn production like sure. where do i start like here you go like it's still in the works but we're gonna we're gonna get there um because i've done about a year's worth of educational like content mm -hmm. uh consumption so when i look at like youtube videos now on production i'm like okay like this is actually quality and can help people out um as far as dude zero dollars man okay so you're not or gonna maybe not zero dollars but like if you're going to start from absolute, like, basic. Yeah, and okay. just whatever money you have in your sure. pocket. Okay, so I started off with a, a Hercules Impulse 500, which was, like, a $200 controller, mm -hmm. or, like, maybe $300 controller. So not that expensive, and it plugs directly into your laptop. And you can get... Uh, that only runs on Serato, which is, like, a DJ mm -hmm. software. You can get that free trial for, 
like 90 days or something. So just make a new email every time. Sure. Yeah. Change glasses. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Shave your mustache. Yeah. Shave, yeah. <laughs> Inconspicuous. Um, yeah. So you can do that. Um, like I said, YouTube's free. If you, if you want to take this seriously, I would definitely immediately just start getting into production because that's going to be the most time consuming, like right. hardest learning curve. So, and you can get Ableton, uh, at least back in the day, you can get Ableton 90 days for free. It's like a full well, trial. And then like a lot of the DAWs, they'll have student versions yes. or yeah, free trials or whatever. And you kind of find your way around that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's everyone's always, it's same thing with, uh, we had that conversation. There was that person that came up when we were at the Codependent. They're like, oh, I, I've got $600 and I want to get a camera set up. And I was like, looking into my $3,000 camera. I was like, I mean, you can try. Your phone's better yeah. in that, at that point. Not trying to sound like you have to have everything expensive, but if you're trying to do it as a profession or a business, I mean, you gotta invest in it, especially if you are gonna pursue it full time. I mean, once you put your LLC or whatever together, you can expense it against your taxes because yeah. it is, you're buying the thing that makes you money. Right. But yeah, and, I, and is there digital software? Like if you didn't have an actual physical controller, could you like run a virtual controller through some type of app or, I guess the apps have the virtual running yeah. in it, right? So, uh, Serato and Rekordbox are gonna be the two like main apps you can use. Um, I actually did, I randomly like hooked up to like a Bluetooth speaker and I was like DJing from my laptop. I was gonna say, did people do that? Did people just come in with just the laptop? And <laughs> uh, I mean, I'd never seen that before. I don't think that's possible. I mean, you could, but your transitions are not gonna be great. And right. it's just gonna be like, kind of like, it's kind of lame. Yeah. You're just doing, you know. I did it because I didn't have a controller and I was in Tulum and some girls wanted me to like DJ. So I was like, all nice. right, like <laughs> just hook up to the speaker and do it. But um, yeah, so again, I think it's like important just learn production as fast as possible and like as efficiently as possible because that's gonna essentially set you apart from a lot of people in your market space. So, you know, I could teach someone to DJ in maybe like a week pretty, mm -hmm. pretty proficiently as far as like production it's going to take me months. Sure. And I'm, I mean, dude, I'm, I'm nowhere decent enough to teach people. It's a time. lot. I mean, yeah, it's, as everybody thinks it's, oh, it's just, you know, they might look at electronic music. Oh, it's just, you just throw things in and you just put it together. But that's not how it works. No. It's, you can't, if you could just throw things together, everybody could do it. But yeah, I mean, with working with the engineers, the audio engineers that I've worked with, it just the mind numbingly super tight to the grid. Like you have to make sure every beat is correct and you have to make sure the velocity is correct. The nice thing is you're pulling out samples so you don't have to record them. If they're like the biggest misconception with bands is oh, I'll just go in and we'll just we'll spend four hours in the studio and record a whole song. No. You can do maybe one guitar tracking in four hours. Yeah. It it's, just it, the the concept of time is not and, and the thing is is like you, you hire an audio engineer and you're like, okay, I want to do a single. And they're like, all right, you know that range can be anywhere between 800 bucks to $2,000 a song. And they're like, whoa, that's a lot. And you're like, yeah, but you want this song to last forever. You want it to be radio played and, and music has to be, especially now with how competitive it is and how many people can do things from home. If you want to get playlisted, you know, I'm showing you that all those different tools. You want to get playlisted, radio play, it has to meet a certain standard. And granted, if the song's just a banger and the, and the tracks are kind of crap, then that's like a really rare coincidence. But you really have to know the the trends and the standards, which it sounds like electronic music has just a giant wide range of genres, I guess, because you're considered tech house, is that yep. what it is? Yep. So what would tech house entail for someone who doesn't know anything about electronic music, basically me? <laughs> um, it's gonna be like more traditional like club breakdowns with like heavy synthesizers, um, heavy drops that are gonna like be more, um, you know, like just hype, yeah, bigger, bigger energy. stuff like that. Yeah, like whereas like traditional house is a little bit more, um, I wouldn't say like down tempo. It's more it's, back. It's more background versus foreground. Sure, you're more foreground. You're like people are really engaging in music versus traditional houses. You're at an event and yeah. there's music playing. Or um, I would say like with tech house too, it's like again like heavy synths, like using different sounds in that sense, and then. Uh, vocals don't always have to be at the, the forefront of the track. It's kind of like accents. Yeah, you can have accents or you could like make that the, the focal point and build the track around it. So it's kind of just more of like a, I think of it as like kind of like a dirty, like stank face, like you're in the club and you're just like- Stank like, face. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Cause you'll hear something and you're just like, what the fuck, like this is sick, yeah. And you're just like going at it. But um, yeah, there's something I to do. There's bass house, there's dubstep, like hard step if you really want to just I don't know, I can't get into that shit, but 
It's um, too much. It's a little bit too much for me, but I mean, people like it, man. It's uh, it's a genre. And then I've actually started to get a little bit more into techno because it has like that gritty, like industrial feeling, sure. which is kind of fun when you're just like three in the morning, all blacked out, like shades on, and you're just like pumping. Yeah. So it's kind of fun. But uh, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, I want to come back on the tracks that you're doing this year. Also touch on, um, which sounds kind of shallow, but it's true, like aesthetics and also just look, uh, fashion that kind of goes into it. Because when you're an artist, you're essentially selling a brand, a package, and you kind of have to look a certain way if you're going to do it professionally. So we'll be right back. with Risky Stays, the one show that we don't know if there's another episode. But we have one today, and it's with my buddy Nick Nolan. So before we left, uh, we were touching on the music you're going to put out this year, as well as aesthetic, overall branding. So we'll, we'll, we'll hit that in a little second. But in terms of music production, you said you want to do about 10 to 15 songs this year. You already have Conejos is out, mm -hmm. and then Old School has been out mm -hmm. since 2023, last year. So um, maybe first tell us about those two tracks and then talk about what's in the pipeline and kind of your vision and direction of what you're trying to do for the rest of the songs. Sure. Uh, so Old School was the first track I put out. Um, that was after like eight months of learning production. So I wanted to get something on the board that I felt comfortable with. Mm -hmm. um, granted, now that I look back on it, I'm like, okay, like I could have made improvements here. It's not always like my favorite thing to listen to, but... I think uh, as you progress as an artist as well, you're gonna always look back on your first it's thing and be like, to see is, it. Well, and it's yeah. good too if people can see the progression because if you got like some bangers and mm -hmm. they go back and listen, they're like, oh, that's cool. But like you could tell it wasn't right. Like it's kind of like the, you know, like Arctic Monkeys is a good example. I mean, they've really just changed their sound over time. But the early stuff is awesome. I like yeah. I think it's yeah. awesome. Middle stuff is great. Later stuff, you know, not my cup of tea, but then you do see that full progression that they've gone through so it's important to keep that on there yeah absolutely um i think man when you're looking at you know those those artists that just come out of nowhere and they just have banger after banger people think like oh no they're just like geniuses and i'm like no it's i mean they're definitely smart and they know their craft but there is years yeah. behind what they've been doing or in the it's background. an industry plant i mean yeah yeah you can do a ghost producer shit like that but i mean i don't think the majority of people that are taking this seriously are doing that because Think about it this way, right? Like if I, if you were another big EDM artist and you're like, hey, Nick, I really like your, your song from Yango, so it was really cool. Like, do you want to collab on a song? I now don't have the expertise and the experience to sit down at a DAW right. and make music. Because then you're going to, you're going to know that I'm a fraud, essentially. Right. And be like, oh, this guy just has a ghost producer, like, whatever. Like, and I'm not trying to knock people for doing that, but mm -hmm. I, at the same time, you might as well just learn. <laughs> well, in the very beginning, you definitely want to have a base. If you get to that point where you're in that bigger realm and you're with a label or you're with some type of management, they might require you to have songs a certain way. It's just, it's just how it is, is the further up you go the ladder, if you don't, if you're, if you're truly independent, you can do whatever you want, but 99.9% .9 of artists, once they get to a certain level, they're, they need management, they need some type of yeah. funding, they need some backing, and unfortunately that comes with then whatever that label or that manager wants and knows what will work, whether it's what you want to do or not. So it's like a weird, you know, push and pull, but obviously like learning the fundamentals first and doing it yourself first is the way to go. Um, so you've got the two out and then what else you got coming out or what else you're working on? You showed me some things at your apartment that- Sure, so cool. uh, like I said, Old School's out, Conejos, I made it in Tulum. So it's more of like a Latin tech house track. Something that just like more gets you moving in the club. I thought it was kind of fun. Tested it out there, made a lot of revisions. We put it out and it's been doing pretty solid on numbers. Um, but as far as like moving forward, I mean, dude, it, it kind of like changes with the season. It changes with my mood. Uh, I do like having more of like a club sort of vibe, mm -hmm. but I mean, summer's coming up. So maybe I'll, I'll switch it up and do more like a housey, like piano track or something more like summer feel to it. But right now we're working on my third track. It's about like 95% done. And it is more of like a club, like mm -hmm. big, like, melt your face. yeah, just, it, yeah. It's a melt your face kind of track, which is fun, man. I, I like that. But um, my, my variety and like range of music that I want to make is not just like, okay, we're taking this lane. It's like, okay, we can kind of like dab on all spaces. I don't think it's fun 
more enjoyable to be pigeonholed into one genre, um, which I know is not very much like on brand, but mm -hmm. I've seen big artists like take those kind of, you know, uh, this big techno artist that I follow, she's awesome, right? Like, she always produces techno, but she did like an Afro house, like kind of like Tulum beat, mm -hmm. and everyone was like, this is awesome, so. Well, you can also, if you, especially if you start just busting out songs, you can have a full set of just one genre and a full set of another. Sure. Like for example, I agree, this is an extreme example, but like Global Plague, my band, the metal band, we have what's considered progressive metal, which has like singing and screaming. And then we have this like more traditional, like death metal leaning, more just heavy as shit. And like, but we can play two different sets of two different types of bands depending on who we're with, which is kind of cool because it gives you some versatility. Just as long as you're not like totally abandoning. Like if we were like a pop band and a technical death metal band, very, very hard to pull that off. That'd be very interesting to see that, but yeah. There are some <laughs> bands that, that tend yeah. to mix. Well, I mean, maybe not pop, but there's some there's some metal bands that have pop sensibility where they like sing the choruses, but then they have, and it's it's cool to see, of course, you're gonna get everybody's like, oh, this is a bunch of shit. But, you know, at the end of the day, whatever's popping will work. So got 10 to 12 or 10 to 15 songs in the works. Uh, in terms of like the production elements, you said we, so you're working with, maybe like a team where you work with some different people how does that how does that look with you you know as you're creating stuff sure so all the production like the like all the production is done by me and then i have like mentors that i will send the track to we'll sit down like a coaching session and be like okay man like let's fix this or like sure. hey we can improve on this which i think is so important in this space to have like someone you can basically talk to that has the experience, yeah. right? Without like cheating and being like, hey man, make a song for me, let me have it. Well, it's just, it's constructive criticism. The right. thing is, is, if you're gonna put it out, it's gonna be out forever. You want, I mean, I, anytime we do a song, I send it to five different people. Exactly. Yeah. Then you, they, you let them tell you exactly what they think, you know, try to have them do it unbiased. Like, if someone hates it, just have them tell you it sucks. Cause unfortunately it's just gonna, it's gonna happen. You're gonna have songs that are not good. You know, everybody does. And the first five bands I was in, every song had fucking sucked. But then you just learn and you just keep going. It's And it's also one of those things where, not saying this is gonna happen to you, but like you put out eight songs and they all suck. You might think, maybe the music's not for me. But the thing is like, if that's a good lesson to learn as you go along, or you actually then vet it for people and you have the constructive criticism process and then you just basically chisel down the songs until they are perfect. And it's, it's, it's hard for a lot of artists to take criticism like that because you work so hard on it. Some people wanna shut down after that. Have you ever felt um, maybe you made a song and then either a mentor or someone came back to you and they basically kind of like told you to scrap it or, or change something that you you felt really passionate about and you had like a, a tough mental, emotional time with taking something or do you feel like you're pretty logical and analytical when you get that stuff? I'm definitely more logical and analytical. And also like, I, I mean, if you're going to get shut down from a song, not getting a million plays on your first release, like, well, I don't know what you're gonna do. Yeah, you're, you're not gonna, gonna you're, you're not, not gonna, gonna survive it. out here, man. Like it's it's all about like being consistent, dude. So and you know this too as an artist and as a performer, it's like, okay, maybe this show sucked, or like maybe this song wasn't the best, but like you're still gonna keep progressing forward. And the way I kind of look at it too, I was like, all right, one of my favorite tech house artists is Chris Lake. He's the most popular, like big time DJ slash producer, has amazing songs, like some of the best production I've ever seen. And I was curious one day, I was like, okay. You know, that dude has been in the game for almost like 30 fucking years. So let's go back on Spotify to like his first release in like 2002, I think it was, or like 1998. It's nothing special. It's just like a, okay, cool, like house track, sounds whatever, nothing right. crazy. But over the course of time, did he stop at that first track? No, like he just kept building up his artist, you know, persona and, and developed his own sound to the point where it's like, okay, cool. I remember listening to this guy and seeing him live in a dingy little club in, in FSU. And it was awesome. And people were just like really vibing with the music. So, but that took from, that was like in 20, 2014. So from 2000 to 2014, this guy's still making music and trying to make it work. So it just, it's just gonna take time. And I, I fully realize that. And I'm not gonna get discouraged based on, you know, a song not hitting as hard as I think it is. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to uh, you know, make as much music as you can. And if you think it's worthwhile to put out, like you should just put it out. Like, you know, obviously get some criticisms and don't, don't make shit, don't make right. shit music. But uh, <laughs> if you're, if you're loving it and you think it's, you know, maybe something that you really want to put out and, and you're passionate about it and you think it's great, then do it. And then maybe a year from now, you'll look back on it. It's like that song. 
and sucked. Like that's just the way it, your taste will develop and everything will just kind of fall into balance over time. Well, age plays a big point in it too, you know, there's such a heavy emphasis in the entertainment music industry on the young people because young people are like, other young people see themselves in their image and, you know, they want to be like that person. But I feel like you, at least in terms of songwriting and successful songwriting, you know, from a, from like a rock band, you know, singer songwriter standpoint, the more life experience you have, the more you kind of cut out the bullshit and you just do the thing. So like now you be in 28, you know, versus if you started doing DJing when you were 20, 21, you probably would have very different. Yeah. I'd probably be a lot interests. more drunk. <laughs> you a lot more what? A lot more drunk and hungover. Yeah, yep, exactly. A lot more just shitty days and yeah. probably not great music. So, but, uh, but then speaking of image, so, you know, the DJ image is something of, it, it seems like it's pretty more, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. It seems like it's a little bit more important than like what rock bands and pop bands go through. Like a lot of DJs, I feel like you gotta be like cool and you gotta be like, or maybe it's not. I mean, have you seen some DJs that are just like, don't give a shit about image. Like, I'm just gonna play this set. But I, or, you know, on the flip side, it's like, okay, wear this type of shirt, wear this type of uh, accessories and have this kind of look or this kind of vibe. Um, do you have like, do you consciously think of a brand and an image or do you just kind of be you and you just go out and do your thing? Uh, definitely the latter. I mean, I, I definitely like having good style and, and dressing like in a cool way or whatever, like that feels comfortable for me. But I think that's important for any artist is like, hey man, like whatever you're gonna feel comfortable showing up in and playing and you know, maybe it's goofy or maybe it's like more. They just don't wear cargo shorts and a tank top. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to do that. I mean, maybe that's your gimmick, like for sure, then do it. But um, I mean, I see a lot of people that just wear like all black mm. and a hoodie and everything. And I'm like, I have definitely been in that too. I've definitely just worn like comfortable clothes, like baggy shirt, like ball cap mm. glasses and call it a day. Um, but I'm comfortable in that. and I know like the persona like you you're describing is like you got to look like the cool kid basically and um i mean you can take that to an extreme and and really just like not talk to anybody and just show up and play but i don't know i think it's cool if you have your own like sense of style and it's it works for you let me tell you i played a show wearing shorts and all well i was in a rock band i think it's different if i was doing like vocals on a metal band and i was wearing all black but i was wearing like douchey Frat, I'll, I'll try to, if like I remember, I'll put, I'll put a picture. Okay. No, not chubbies. I'll put a picture <laughs> here. There's a picture of me doing it. I was wearing like brown shorts. It just it looked horrible. Um, but, and the thing is like, you don't, you don't really have to have image, but I think as, as you're doing it as a profession, like social media presence, we've been talking about, you know, social media strategy, which it's a, a necessary evil that I think everybody has to do because unfortunately most people don't discover anything by just walking into, unless they just walk into codependent and just happened to me there, which has probably happened. But the fastest way to actually build that brand is to have that online presence. And then you're also submitting it to playlists and you're working with labels and you're trying to do cross promotion. You know, Instagram now has those collab posts, which helps a lot too. Yeah. So yeah, I just want to touch on that because it, it seems like it's, it's a weird gray area. Some people take it really seriously where like image is everything, but then those bands usually have a management or some type of, you know, bigger power that's pushing them towards that. Mm -hmm. But I feel like, you know, original artists, artists that are making their way up, they can probably develop their own image and maybe have just a little bit of taste and flair. You kind of have more of that like, uh, yeah, comfortable, kind of like the, the dark aesthetics. Uh, and definitely like for the band, like the metal band, you know, I'm not going to be wearing uh, a Tommy Bahama shirt or wearing, you know, uh, like black. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. just kind of the, the main thing. But um, any closing statements, anything else that you want to put out there? Obviously, like your Instagram is at Nick underscore Nolan, right? Or is uh, it? Underscore Nick underscore Nolan, yeah. Okay. The, there we go. the original Nick Nolan is like some burner account. I can't get it. It sucks. No. <laughs> I've tried to hit that up. But um, some closing things. I think if you're just starting out, like I said, like, you know, be, be consistent, definitely just show up every day, even if it's like a small increment, because if I know anything to be true, man, in, in this life, it's like, if you just show up and put in a little bit of work, even if it's 20 minutes of crate digging or mm -hmm. you're just like doing production, right? Like that amounts over time to years worth of experience and yeah. understanding of what it is, right? And I mean, I'm a year and some change into this, so you're actually the first, uh, you made my first poster for one of my shows uh, back in February. So we're coming up about a year on like even just making <laughs> making shows happen. Um, I was your first. 
That was your first, yeah. And I'm the last. And the last. No one's ever allowed to make any posts. Yeah. <laughs> He's trademarking this. Yeah. No, uh, little victories every day is really important, especially when you're like with me doing this type of stuff. I mean, when I come, when I go back to Indiana, I've got eight, ten projects that are all just sitting on top of my head. But I know as soon as I get back, you know, I have a sixteen-hour drive. The first thing I'm gonna do on Sunday is just sleep. You yeah. Know, like do nothing. Monday rolls around, I'm gonna go, you know, do my thing. But yeah, just if you do, you know, we're talking about like the 30, 30 minutes of social media a day. Mm-hmm. Um, you just set the time, you do the thing, and then you forget about it. Yeah. Uh, the more you can do social media, the better. But it's just realistically, it's it's a soul suck for quite a lot of people. But yeah, doing little things every day is super important. I mean, that's just a life lesson. You know, work out for 30 minutes, go hang out with your friends for an hour. Do things in little bursts because you can't, you know, stack everything up and do it all at once. So if you want to become a world famous DJ, it's not going to happen in a year. It's not going to happen in two years, five years. Or maybe it does, but like realistically, it just takes time. Um, it's sick, dude. Yeah, this is awesome. We're in the Andy Warhol room, by the way. If you see all these pictures of people around, you might not even be able to see it with the uh, the depth of field. But it's cool. The lights been turning on and off. The uh, AC has been turning on and off. Yeah, it's hot as shit in here. It's hot as shit. So <laughs> we're going to get out of here. Risky Stays with 45 Creations and Nick Poland.